Hello, and welcome back to Hold On and Talk It, brother. My name is Joe Greenwood. This is the Sunday Post. Now, I was tempted to delay this today so that I could uh, get my thoughts in on the uh, Jake Paul vs. Tommy Fury uh, slop later this evening, but I thought I'd save that pleasure for Tom when we come back on Wednesday, Wednesday or Thursday this week, to talk about the John Jones vs. Cyril Garn fight. Obviously, we'll open with Paul vs. Fury on that one, and then we'll uh, get to the smaller stuff from there, but, you know, I thought that'd be an appropriate platform for this, whereas today I'm going to, you know, tidy up the loose ends from this weekend. I will get to the UFC. I will get to that. Um, I mean, calling it a main event is um, a choice, not one that I would go for, but we'll get to it. I, I'm going to start off um, at Bellator in Dublin. Main event, Yaroslav Amoslov defeats Logan Storley by unanimous decision. Uh, Amosov, this is his first fight in two years, um, won the title in June 2021, and then uh, uh, from Douglas Lima, and then from there um, was, uh, <laughs> well, taken out of action by the uh, war in Ukraine, in which he was fighting on the front lines. And he uh, comes back to Bellator to face Logan Storley, a man he faced before uh, in a fight that I really recommend people uh, checking out. If you want, basically, um, Gamrot versus Sarukian level scrambles, but at welterweight, give that fight a watch. It's a really scrambly affair, really exciting exchanges there in the grappling. But what we got uh, on Saturday night, he said, was something a bit different. Amosov, uh, defending a Storley. Storley was the interim welterweight champion due to uh, Amosov being unavailable. Um, he beat uh, Michael Venom Page uh, for that title, the split decision win. It was a very odd fight, one where even Scott Coker said afterwards, oh, I don't think he won this, but because he didn't get any damage off. And that's long been the issue of Storley, is that, like, very, very good grappling, you know, ahead of a lot of the game of a lot of people, but just gets no damage off. Like, he just doesn't really get anything going. But, I digress. Um, so this fight last night, I, I mean, Amosov absolutely just beat Storley up, and there was, like, not a hint of ring rust whatsoever. It was an incredible performance. Really loved the sort of blitzing that uh, Amosov did. Really lovely leg kicks, debilitated Storley's lead leg so that he had to end up switching. And really, if Amosov just sort of, like, committed to that even more, like, so that when he switched and took that lead leg and then just sort of did that Cejudo and Dom Cruz sweeping leg kick from there to keep attacking it, I think he could have probably got Storley out there. He did go to the grappling at one stage and got the better of Storley, and I thought that that was really quite impressive, but it was the blitzing on the feet that I was impressed by. Storley sort of pressing forward, controlling the centre, and then Amosov coming through, blitzing forward through Storley. And then when he would take the centre from those blitzes, lovely low leg kicks, lovely kicks up the middle. Just really, really good stuff. Like, a greater variety in his striking. Storley kind of got, like, stuck in this sort of, like, one-two sort of cycle. Never really got anything going beyond that. I will talk about another fight in a minute of one guy just getting completely stuck in the mud with one game plan, and that was in one. Um, for those who have seen it, know what I'm talking about already. But, yeah, Amosov was really, really impressive. Really impressive, and considering the context of his victory, um, yeah, very surprising how dominant he was over Storley. Um, having said that, I <laughs> struggle to see who he's gonna who's gonna challenge him in Bellator. The man is now twenty seven and zero. It's um, a very very impressive run, eight and zero in Bellator. Um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm struggling to struggling to see what what he's got left in Bellator. I mean, you know, if I'm him, I keep fighting there. I keep building up my resume, get to thirty and zero, and then from there, see what's available. Um, you know, we'll talk about the UFC card in a minute, but they don't seem to be interested in signing guys like this at the moment, which is a real shame. The sort of 
I don't know how to describe it, but like the in wrestling terms, you've got your, your top of the card guys, and you have your mid card guys and your lower card guys, and they don't seem to be that interested in signing these mid card guys anymore. Um, to upper mid card, and it's, it seems very very odd to me their sort of hesitancy to go for these guys because it's like I think both of the these Storley and Amosov would be in the top ten in the UFC, and I think Amosov would be going up towards top five. Like I think he'd be a challenge for any one of those guys there. His wrestling is absolutely superb. Defensive and offensively. It's um like Storley just got nothing going. Like he got in close off the clinches and got sort of a couple body locks, but nothing beyond that. And Amosov like had really strong uh, underhook game. And then when he finally went to take Storley down, lovely uh, outside trips from him. So really, really impressed by Amosov in this fight. And uh you know, we'll keep an eye on him um, on the show um, due to his story being actually very surprising that he came back and looked this good and actually looked like he'd levelled up considering the circumstances. Like, where has he had the time to train if he's, like, on the front line? But he managed to get something in there. So, incredible performance from Amosov. Um, as for the rest of this Bellator card, I just... It's, they're so desperate for Peter Queeley to have some sort of level of quality because his walkout in Dublin is incredible coming out to Zombie by the Cranberries. Like, you know, it makes sense to try and push him, but he just doesn't... He doesn't have it. Um, he lost um, uh, by ground and pound to Bryce Logan. Lovely elbow in the clinch. Dropped Queeley. Bit of ground and pound. Off you go out of there. That's the only other notable thing from that card, in my opinion. Um, I want to talk about one. I want to talk about one, and it's probably the best fight I saw this weekend. Uh, Fabricio de Andrade Day, I think they would pronounce it, but I'm going to go with Andrade, if that's all right with you. It defeats John Lineker for the vacant bantamweight title. In one, bantamweight in one is 145, not 135. They did it in a ring. They did it in the ring, and, you know, it was, uh, <laughs> it was interesting. A couple little uh, grabs of the rope there. I saw your Andrage. Very cute and funny what you did there. Um, Andrage wins, and he wins simply because he was throwing straight shots. John Lineker is a lot shorter than him, and it was infuriating that the first two rounds, he was just winging hooks, yeah, he was landing, landing to the body, landing to the head. You know, it was like there's moments where I was, I would, I'd see him winding up, the, and I'd hit pause, and I would make, I'd try and guess where he was going to land, and I couldn't get it. Like it was just there was no clear setup of where he was going. There's no clear tell. So God knows what that was like for Andrade. All Andrade really had to do though was that when he saw that big winding hook come up, if he was in position. Well, if he's not in position, retreat get out of that space. But if he's in position, throw the jab down there. Like, let's say uh, Lineker's throwing his right hook. Andrade would throw the left jab, which would in turn basically block the shot, and then the right would come straight down behind it. Because Lineker was really winding them up, really, really winding up these hooks. It was like, it was getting nowhere near at points. It was... Um, it wasn't a good performance for him. So Andrade was hitting like, well, it was, making, it was making for an exciting fight, but it was making for also a very frustrating viewing experience of watching Lineker. Because when you're throwing these hooks, you're basically taking this very long route to get to your target. So then the guy that you're facing can then throw a straight, which is a shorter journey. And then when you're already the shorter fighter, it's becoming getting even further away. But those are his big knockout shots. So Andrade was just throwing one twos and knees up the middle. Really lovely knees up the middle, busting Lineker up. And then Lineker starts to get back into it, end of the second, beginning of the third, when he starts throwing a jab, and you're like, oh, John, mate, please just throw more of those, because he was really catching Andrade with them. But yeah, I think it was too little, too late. Andrade just sort of like sapped the energy from Lineker at that stage, and Thankfully, the fight was called off uh, between the fourth and fifth rounds in the corner. Lineker's face was completely closed up, but Andrade, super impressive performance. Very, very impressive. 
he's a big man for that division. I know Lineker's short, but Andrade is. Uh, it just looks like it. Just, I mean, maybe it was that that sort of contrast in size. Andrade is on an eight fight win streak. He had the weird no contest with um, Lineker that ended after an accidental groin strike. But six and zero in one on an eight fight win streak. Um, yeah, probably the biggest biggest win of his career so far. In fact, it definitely is. Um, yeah, very, very impressive from George. I really recommend checking it out because, yeah, it was very, very impressive. Also, how he got up. There was a great moment where Lineker had like an overhook, um, but in the takedown, and George was sort of defending it. He had one hand down, he had his other hand down, his left hand, and Lineker had the overhook on Andrade's right arm. And Lineker just like, and they're facing the same way, so it's sort of like Lineker's kind of behind him, and he drags him down. And you're like, okay, Lineker's going into a good position there. And Andrade, every time he was taken down, just you know, it was Derek Lewis esque. He's sort of like, just I'm going to stand up, just going to get up, and that's it. Lineker couldn't get any grappling going there, but yeah, very impressive from Andrade. Excited to see what they do next with him. Let's get to the UFC. Two fights I want to talk about. The uh, supposed main event between Andre Muniz and Brendan Allen. Nikita Krilov pulling out mere hours before the main event against Ryan Spence. Some weird illness came in. Um, doctor said he couldn't compete. Okay, fine. Brendan Allen and uh, Andre Muniz step up. Muniz is very frustrating in this. Um, you know, I thought he was winning it on the feet. Again, really nice blitzes through. Um, but when he got to the ground, I was surprised at how dominant... Brendan Allen was over him. He's really, really dominant. He like had him sussed out. There was, I mean, there was the moment when Muniz went for the takedown and Allen sweeped him as they were going down, and he ended up on top. Didn't really get much going. I gave Allen that round. It was the second round, so I had it one-one going into the third. And then in the third round, um, Allen takes Muniz down, and then gets the back. Works from that back position. And then just slowly starts like cranking on that. Gets the choking. Doesn't really go for it fully. Just has it on the chin. Just sort of squeezes on the chin. And it's really uncomfortable. And he, the patience though. But he, he has this patience. You can see that Muniz is like, you know, I can get through this. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. But Alan just kept working his arm further and further down. It's like he had it over the chin. Then he had it like half over the chin. And then it just got under the neck. Muniz gets away. And then he got, kept getting it deeper and deeper. As he kept progressing forward. Great patience from Allen. And he gets the win. Muniz taps to the RNC. And it was very frustrating. Again, a very frustrating performance to watch. Because like, I thought Muniz was getting the better of um, Allen on the feet. I thought Allen was just kind of like throwing some big straights. Not really much of a setup. And then Muniz was sort of like coming back quite well. I thought he had landed some really lovely one twos in there. Um, even landed. There was a moment. I think it was in the second. No, it was at the beginning of the third. Sorry, where um, Muniz was landing two threes. He was really landing really nice front hand hooks and rear hand hooks as well on Allen. It's just he didn't have to go to the ground. Muniz has the ability to keep it off the ground. I think just absolutely exhausted from having Allen on top of him at the end of the second. If Muniz had a bit more about him, disengage at points, take a moment, take your breath, and then come back in, because he was winning that fight on the feet. But Alan gets the win. Unranked beats number 11, Andre Muniz. Really should take his ranking. Should go in at number 11 or 12. Four fights, four wins in a row now for Alan. Um... I'm trying to think who he should really be calling out for. I mean, you want to be looking for you want to be looking for a nice, easy target if you're Brendan and get you established more in those rankings. Maybe the winner of Gastelum versus Curtis that could be a good one. Get these guys uh, face off against each other. Oh yeah, that'd be a good one. Yeah. Uh, as for Muniz, I probably should question why he took this fight. Is that Jessica Andrade, Aaron Blanchfield thing again? Why did you take this fight? Why did you accept the fight? Maybe no one wanted to face Muniz. Like, well, I've got to keep my name out there. Got to keep going. This is the best option. Unranked guy. 
you know, his best win was Christoph Jotko. Again, that was a very impressive performance, but again, Christoph Jotko. Muniz's wins are a lot more impressive. Maybe I can get good sort of like reps in there. But it just wasn't just wasn't clicking for him on the ground. Really surprised at how much more active Alan was. Um, um on the ground. It was also interesting how he um used side control. Like he was he would only sort of like used it to either like go back to half guard or to like to pin an arm like he never like sort of did anything in half uh, sorry in side control he just wanted to like either progress forward or go backwards which really is the best thing to do like side control i've got i've got to say i think is pretty much a useless position unless you try and get it towards a crucifix or a pinning uh, motion but um you're not really going to get that too often at the high end of mma um then I recollect Aaron Blanchfield doing it to uh, Meatball Molly McCann. That should tell you everything. Um, then I have to mention Tatiana Suarez. Really impressive performance against Montana De La Rosa. De La Rosa fought that gu- guillotine choke for quite a while. That leaping, that sort of, um, how do you how do you say it? Like a pulling guillotine Suarez hit. Very impressive, the tightness that she got on there. Kept adjusting those sort of like micro adjustments in there moving her elbow closer and closer in um, as it kept going. Like, initially, De La Rosa sort of got that space there, and then you could see that, like, Suarez, when, like, De La Rosa sort of sat up, the elbow sort of, like, started to pull away, and then when she came in, she saw the opportunity, when she got able to pull it back down into the guillotine, she moved the elbow in further to uh, tighten the grip on there. Really impressive from Suarez for someone who's been away for that long. Um, showed good strength as well, upper division. She said that apparently she just wants to get a fight in and straw rate is where she wants to be. But man, if she's doing that to De La Rosa at Flyway, yeah, maybe path of least resistance. <laughs> it could be the best way to go. I was saying that if she's able to get down to straw weight and do those cuts and be comfortable and get a win in there in the next couple months like get try and get a fight in there immediately <sighs> i don't see many women down there stopping those takedowns like i really really don't like you're gonna have to be so elusive to get away from uh, tatiana suarez so yep i'm uh, fully on board that train i think suarez will be getting to a title fight sooner rather than later anyway that was the sunday post Thank you so much for joining me. And we'll be back on some point this week, maybe Wednesday or Thursday, to preview UFC 285. Headlined by John Jones versus Cyril Garn. Co-main event, Valentina Shevchenko versus Alexa Grasso. Also got Mateus Gamrot versus Jalen Turner. And the debuting Bo Nickel against Jamie Pickett. There's another fight on that card that I can't remember. Oh! Jeff Neal versus Shavkat Rachmanov. Oosh! The good stuff. Right, see you then. Have a nice Sunday. I've been loving you a long time. Down all the years, down all the days. And I've cried for all your troubles. Smile at your funny little way. We watched our friends grow up together And we saw them as they fell Some of them fell into heaven Some of them fell into hell I took shelter from a shower And I step into your arms On a rainy night in Soho The wind was whistling all its charm I sang it while my sorrow All your joy 
I'm not sure. 